Innovation can leave footprints in a population to be passed down generations. And later on, with a sufficient amount of sequence from a varied sample of the population, it's possible to rediscover such footprints and actually use those to paint a detailed picture of the recombination landscape. Occasionally, with such a detail that you can pinpoint the actual base where a gene conversion tract starts or ends. I'll be discussing this landscape in a plant, the monkey flower, and at the base of such an analysis, at the very core, is a four gamut test. Imagine two neighboring SNPs in the genome within a few bases from each other, say. At some point in the past, there was a mutation on site one that created two distinct haplotypes in the population. At some later time, another mutation must have happened to, and in this, at this point, three haplotypes were in circulation in the population. If this is all that happened, no matter how you look, you would never see more than three distinct haplotypes in the population. Suppose you were to look at two particular SNPs and nonetheless see all four combination of alleles. Then you'd conclude that one of two things have happened. Either some recurrent mutation had conspired to create the fourth possible haplotype, or what turns out to be more prevalent, the cut and paste action of a gene conversion or crossover will have made that four haplotype, fourth haplotype. Let me quickly reiterate what we are actually looking for. We have seen similar figures in, in the previous talks. Uh, all recombinations is initiated with a double-stranded break, which in itself is not really observable what location that happened at. But uh, then you get the resection, D-loop, strand inversion, D-loop, extension and migration. And suppose you are lucky enough to Pro, uh, do the four gamut tests in the vicinity of this double stranded break, you might actually be able to, if those two SNPs happen to span across the boundary that gets created, whether or not it's resolved as a gene conversion or a crossover, you might get lucky and observe the fourth uh, haplotype here. In and of itself, that doesn't have much power, but when you then start to perform this test 11 and a half million times in the genome, you're starting to gain momentum. And this is the aim of this uh, project here, to perform, as it turns out, more than 11 million four gamut tests. And I'm really using probes of SNPs that are less than 50 bases apart, so very close. Um, and it, for all probes, I test 50 individual chromosomes in a wild growing population of monkey flowers. With that, I'll hope to characterize detailed patterns of historical recombination, as well as shed a little bit of light on the fine structure of recombination and gene conversion. So why pick the monkey flower for this? Uh, part of it is very pragmatic. We all, I already happen to have two billion reads of Illumina lying around from, um, <laughs> from a pooled DNA sample from 98 wild diploid plants that was picked by Kevin Wright, formerly a grad student at John Willis's lab, now a postdoc in, in, at Harvard. These were picked to do another project having to do with uh, metal tolerance in, in, in Mimulus. And while we are waiting for this to sort of uh, mature and get uh, done, I figured I would uh, hijack the data and use it for this uh, project in the meantime. And it turns out to be very ideal because also Mimulus is extremely diverse, which makes it easy to distinguish one chromosome from another. And finally, what turns out to be important, we have an annotated reference sequence of Mimulus Gutatus made at the, done at the JGI. So this is why. Data analysis, first align all those two billion reads, uh, which covers the genome 255 times over and uh, call SNPs, and I was able to identify 9.2 relatively common SNPs with minor allele frequency larger than 5%, and a, a whole lot less common SNPs as well. Um, from there, it's about going through the painstaking exercise of then recording every single read 
what are, in, in which cases does that read cover two neighboring SNPs? And that identifies the haplotype for that particular read. And you do that over and over again until you've analyzed all the reads. And then you select a subset of the such events to use for your probes. I, I define this as a haplotype event probe or a HEP. And what that is is a subset that first of all, yeah, first of all, I, I exclude some of the SNPs that I know to be amino acid changing based on the annotation just in order to make the interpretation a little bit uh, uh, easier later. I also require that uh, I have haplotype for at least 50 individual chromosomes. Remember the whole sample was about 200 chromosomes. That there are many, many times where I have much more co larger coverage and could have called haplotypes for more than 50, but in the interest of simplicity of interpretation, I again uh, throw away everything less than uh, more than 50. I downsample it to 50 chromosomes. Um, finally, there are some HEPs that have a combination of very rare, uh, hep, uh, very hep, rare alleles that won't give us any power to actually detect all four alleles, even though uh, recombination had happened. So I'm also throwing that away. Uh, even with such relatively strict criteria, we find around 11 and a half million HEPs in the whole genome, and three and a half millions of those are, are distinct. They're not nested, they're not overlapping. I'll present results from both of those sets. So this is what such a, a beast can be visualized as, as uh, two SNPs here, and what, it, what really characterizes it is the distance in bases between the two SNPs, the frequency of the least common allele in, the, in both SNPs, which here turns out to be this A, what happens, 8 out of 50 um, individuals, and finally whether it pass or fail the, uh, fails the 4 gamma test, and by passing the 4 gamma test I mean we see examples of all four combinations in the 50 uh, individual sample. Okay, before we look at the data from the actual HEPs, Let's, uh, we can also from this data infer uh, sort of common population genetic parameters like the mean pairwise difference, which turns out to be nearly 3%. How about that? You walk out into the mountains uh, uh, and pick two flowers that grow literally next to each other, and they are about as different as a human and the orangutan. So clearly there's a lot of this kind of shed some light on why this has not already been done, say, for human. How often in the human genome will you find two SNPs that are eight bases from each other? Sometimes, but not nearly often enough. Um, to go into more detail, the allele frequency spectrum is shown here, uh, as red crosses the folded spectrum. And we notice, uh, as, as usually seen, that uh, SNPs with a rare minor allele frequency are more common in the genome than, than SNPs that are more like 50-50. We also see that uh, this spectrum is even steeper than predicted by you know, a standard coalescent model with the uh, constant effective population size, which will show this. That fits the data poorly. But if you allow the effective population size to actually vary, so increasing exponentially with time, I hope I can convince you that you get a much better fit to the data uh, given a certain uh, population growth rate. And this will be important a little bit later when I'm trying to place, interpret this haplotype, this foregamid test results within the context of a evolutionary model. What it really means that the allele frequency spectrum is steeper is simply that the genealogy looks more star-like than uh, less compressed uh, at the tips than the standard uh, constant uh, in effective coalescence. So it looks more like the three on the right than the tree on the right than the tree on the left. But in both cases, and I'm just going to remind you here that SNPs that happened the mutations that happened a long time ago, say this one, tends to be shared tends to be more common in the population today than a mutation that happened relatively short time ago. So this is simply due to this uh, tree-like structure here. So that also explains uh, why I was interesting, interested before in the least common allele in the, in the hip. 
because it's really not until the last mutation has happened that the hip starts to begin accumulating uh, visible recombination events. Uh, so it depends a lot on so the time you're sampling back in time is uh, depends extraordinarily much on the, on this least common allele free, least uh, lowest allele frequency. With that said, let's look at the, some real data now from the hips. Here are all hips that happen to be in region 500 base upstreams of CDS stars. That might be a little cryptic to you, I am picking those, but uh, that will become clearer later. Uh, there are several gratifying things in this plot. First of all, as expected, you can see that uh, as the distance between the snips in the hip grows larger, you generally see an increasing fraction of them passing the 4 gamut test. That's very nice, uh, because obviously the further apart the positions in the genome, the bigger is the chance that a gene conversion tract landed with one of its ends right between the two SNPs. Also, I have binned the data here in, in order of the minimum frequency um, for 10, 20 and 30 percent common, and you see that all other things being equal, there's a larger fraction of the more common uh, HIPs that uh, passes the 4 gamut test, consistent with that, what I mentioned before, that uh, they sample back longer in time on average. Uh, note that, uh, I mean, this F4 varies a lot from a couple of percent in here and up to about 50 percent, so this is uh, quite uh, striking. Also note, this is a data we are looking at directly, that is what I've said so far is 100 percent model independent. And I'd like to stay model independent for one more slide. What you can do here is to bin the hips in 100 base bins um, f according to distance from the nearest CDS start in the genome. Um, what happens here is there is a striking and that, re that kind of resembles what Adam was showing yesterday for Doug, right? There is a striking increase in recombination events right at the first coding action of the gene. When I first, and I actually as you move into the gene it falls off to a level that's even lower than the, than the background, which we also saw, I also detected in Adam's uh, plot yesterday. And then eventually out at like 10 kilobase it will come back up here. Um, when I first saw that I couldn't quite uh, believe it. Why? I, I had picked the first exon because that's more well-defined in an annotation to say this is where the coding starts as opposed to where the transcription starts, that's a little bit more iffy. Um, but nonetheless what happens is that it's right at the, where the, at the first exon that you see the strongest signal. So that, was, that puzzled me in the, in the beginning, but I think I know why now and I'm going to show you in a couple of slides. But let me first place the whole thing into a coalescent scenario. Uh, much, much of the parameters are actually pretty fixed. We have a sample size of 50. Pick your sort of run of the mill mutation rate of 10 to the minus 8 per base per generation and um, you'll be correct probably within 20 or 30 percent. So that's great. Uh, transition transversion ratio of 4, generation time 1 year. And as you saw before, if we fixed the entire uh, effective population size the right way, we can account for the actually observed allele frequency spectrum. So we do that, and the only thing left to vary is the actual recombination rate per base per generation, um, which can be actually recombination rate per generation, which can actually be written as the recombination per base per generation times the distance between the SNPs in the head. And after that is fixed, what I can do is I can go around and I can go simulate this many, many times, about two years of CPU time, and I, I'm in the position I have access to large clusters of computers, so it took only a single night to do all this uh, thing. I, I recruited a thousand computers to do the job for me. Okay, now let's, with that data in hand, let's revisit what we saw before. And, um, Let's actually try and fit a model to it. A model in which all regions 500 bases upstream are exactly the same recombination won't fit the data. But the next simplest thing will. 
This is a model in which I assume 50% of all promoter regions are turned on. They have a constant enhanced recombination rate of about 3.5 times the mutation rate. And the remaining 50% have zero. Extremely simple model. So when I will not get the, any prizes for best fit of the year for this model, I hope that I can convince you that we kind of have a good understanding of what is going on with such a simple model here. <laughs> Note also that uh, as you tend towards zero, those curves don't cross at uh, 0, 0.0, and this is due to, you know, the, the small fraction of F4 that is actually caused by recurrent mutations. Now, if there is one slide in this entire talk that I would like you to retain in your memories, this would be the one. There's a lot of information here. I've actually taken all multi exon genes, bent the hips according to whether it's in exon 1, 2, 3, exon 1, 2, 3, and or upstream. As you see here, there is very significant drop in the observed recombination events as you move into a gene. The way I interpret that is you're much more likely, or maybe even exclusively, likely to have a double-stranded break happening somewhere upstream of the, in the vicinity of the up promoter region of the gene. And as you have your D-loop extending in and expanding, expanding inwards in the gene, as you get further and further in, more and more D-loops have already terminated, so you get less and less uh, residual D-loops to make a uh, recombination imprint as you get in here. There's also another very visible observation, and that is that uh, as you are encoding exons, you see a much, much higher recombination level than in the introns and non-coding sequence here. But you still see the same uh, falling off pattern. Now, this is some biology that sort of requires an explanation, right? So, I turn to the observation that Mimulus actually have a GC content of 42% in the exons and only 29% in, in introns. Oh, and I should say that herein lie the explanation why we saw that big peak right at the first exon and not upstream or, uh, or some, somewhere else in, in, in the figure I showed you before. So how about, how about this theory? The D-loop extend inverse into the gene when it hits regions of high GC content which typically means more tightly bound DNA, it is more, a little more likely to actually terminate there and get stuck there. And if it makes it past that, it goes into the intern, then it's more likely to get stuck in the next exon. So that's ki that could kind of uh, explain this pattern. To test independently if that was really the case, what I can do is I can take all the probes that are exactly three bases long, so they only have one base be uh, between them. That can either be a GC or an AT base pair. There's 100,000 of these in non-coding area. Here I'm, I'm restricting myself to non-coding. And then you can ask yourself whether or not uh, such, you can make this contingency table uh, to ask whether or not uh, base content is correlated with whether or not it passes the uh, foregamut. And there is a very strong signal here that the GC probes are 20% more likely to have four haplotypes than than the AT from 5 to 6 percent absolute, and that is significant uh, to many digits. So I think, uh, I think I presented some evidence that this might be the case uh, that, that that might explain why exons show more recombinations than introns. I should say quickly that uh, polarity has been reported before in yeast. I started scouring the literature to see has anybody else seen that, and I found this 17 year old paper where they have two genes in. Yeast, they see a similar thing. Don't ask me what this means, but uh, the, the idea is that they, ha they have a double-stranded break, break in front of the gene, and then it uh, tapers off. Finally, if for the next last couple of minutes, I'll talk about the actual, what the actual landscape, landscape looks like. And uh, you could do a sliding window here of 20 probes, and, and here I'm using only the non-overlapping probes. Um, you have to use uh, quite a few, num a small number of probes to get the really good resolution. And this choice actually ends up with a resolution of about 650 bases on average, which is uh, comparable to a uh, gene conversion track length, uh, as it so happens. Uh, and this is only the first megabase of 
the first uh, scaffold that I'm showing here. All the red spikes there uh, indicate hotspots where the observed rate is sometimes 50 times as high as the average rate, which is given by this white line here. And this is uh, the black curve is a simulation of the noise you could expect to see in this. Blue curve here is uh, you know an eight percent fall positive represents an eight percent fall positive rate of these peaks. This is still too large a region to actually absorb. Uh, so let's zoom in on this 60 kilobase region. Now we can start looking at how where those spots are uh, in, in relation to, ge to genes, and it turns out that six out of the seven hotspots uh, in, in this small region here actually are smack at the file end of genes as, uh, as, as I argued before also from a more average point of view. You can also see there are several large genes that, uh, that don't have any visible striking hotspots associated with them. Cold spots are much less uh, strikingly looking in this sort of plot but they are nonetheless highly significant. Um, for example this one you only see two out of 179 probes showing any evidence of passing the four gamut test, and that can be ascribed to uh, uh, recurrent mutation alone is consistent with zero recombination. Note also that such regions are typically right next to hotspots of recombination. You can literally sit at a place in the genome that is piping hot, move one kilobase away and be in the most freezing cold of, uh, of, of places. And as a bioinformaticist, I also I wanted to then see are there certain sequences and motives that are more overrepresented in one versus another. And uh, let me make this uh, short. I hope to find a few promoter binding, si uh, protein binding motives, but instead I find a whole lot of CG rich content. That's again, again, this looks eerily, lo eerily like what Adam was uh, presenting yesterday. Um, so this made me speculate that perhaps hotspots are associated with CPG islands, and indeed they are. You could do a more robust test for that. There is a screaming deficiency of CPG nucleotide outside of hotspots. So that means they tend to be unmethylated. Uh, and that, so this is a boring expression for why recombination, uh, explanation for why recombination happens at the five end of genes. This is simply where the Chromatine is available to the transcription machinery and presumably then also for the complex, to the complex of enzymes that initiate the double-stranded break. That explains that. Um, and it also agrees with what you see generally on a more macroscopic scale in a genetic map. The highly methylated pericentromeric regions tend to be devoid of recombination. So to take away, I have shown a massive amount of data that uh, I'm lucky to reveal a very high resolution recombination map in, in Mimulus. It's extremely non-uniform. It shows strong polarity in about, at least in about half of annotated genes. Um, gene conversion tends to be related with the methylation uh, state. And gene conversion tracks have a tendency to get stuck in GC-rich area. So with that, I, I'm going to thank Kevin for picking the plans, uh, Shu for annotating the genome, and Dan and John for ever, never-ending stimulating conversations. Thank you.